I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Sometimes it takes a different approach to help you unlock your true potential. Capella University's game-changing FlexPath format helps you learn at your own pace and fit earning a degree into your life. From before you enroll to after you graduate, you'll be supported by people who are invested in your success so you can pursue your goals knowing that help is available if you need it. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. I know so many comedians who are unhappy. You know more than I do. But there's not a lot of happy stand-up comedians. <laughs> like, no, although, although I'm happy. and There you go. Uh, you know, I've had... But well, you're probably a shitty comedian. So it's, you know, <laughs> it's true. Yeah. But I, I, I guess I had 20 years of adulthood where I was... Success. No, miserable. Oh, oh. A comedian or a humorist goes into a room and looks for what's wrong. Yeah. And so you have to kind of really practice that over and over again, looking for what's wrong. That is exactly what comedians are doing. Everybody wants the world to be rational. Everybody wants there to be an explanation for things. And yet it's so irrational. And like it's you, completely irrational. Yeah. You can't make humor impaired people right. suddenly have a sense of humor and you can't make stupid people smart and you can't make assholes not be assholes. You can't. So you either can like enjoy them or just ignore them. Those are your best two options. Confronting them is not a good option. You can't make stupid people smart. I want to write that down. Because <laughs> you're so right. That is true. You just finding this out now? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am, because I always want to make them smarter. No. So I have been hoping for this podcast for at least three or four years. I'm so happy to have maybe the best or probably the best humor, humorist, humor writer in the country, Dave Barry. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Wow, that's a, wow. Thank you. No, but seriously, like, you know, I read, uh, I, first off, we're doing this po podcast in a stand-up comedy club that I own. I do stand-up comedy. I read a lot of books by comedians. And I always think the books by comedians are going to be funny, but they're usually more like memoir-ish, whatever. You're, there's one author i think who is laugh out loud funny like i read every page and i'm laughing out loud and it's your books it's Thank very you. hard to read a book where you like laugh out loud because usually like i could even picture like you making a dave barry like joke about this like the purpose of a book is to keep your face absolutely frozen while everyone thinks you're intelligent and you're ac you actually then end up remember memorizing none of it but when i read your books I'm laughing. My face is moving. Well, thank you. It's a different skill, I think. Stand up. I mean, you know, stand up is hard, and it's you know, it takes a lot of practice to be able to do it. Even if you think you're funny with your friends, it's really hard to get up in front of uh, strangers and make them laugh. Um, but you know, it's a different skill entirely from writing funny, where you don't have uh, 
the tools that a comedian has, you don't have pauses, you don't have expression, you don't have emphasis, you don't have hand gestures, you don't, you don't have silence, you don't have any of those tools to use. It's just the words and the reader gets to decide how exactly he or she reads them. So you have to learn a different discipline, I think, to be funny. Well, well, the thing is, uh, and, and by the way, we're here to talk about uh, your most recent book, Lessons from Lucy, where again, uh, so Lucy is your dog. You're, you were turning 70 when you started this book. You're 71 now. Uh, uh, Lucy also in dog years is, te- is 70, is 10 years old. And you were learning all these important life lessons at the age of 70, which are, are great lessons. But again, I see this not as a book about your dog or a book about these life lessons, although they're important. But again, just another vehicle for you to be funny on each page. Like, like I love, and we're gonna get into what you just said in a second, but I just wanna mention, I love um, uh, so many things, but like, I was laughing out loud at your uh, jokes about the AARP, you know, the, you know, getting older. So the AARP is the Association of Retired Professionals. And, you know, you're, you go on and on, like, what, oh. they, they come, they, I get a lot of, do you get art mail yet? How old do you think I am? But uh, <laughs> I, I should be. Well, they the... start early, man. They start like when you're like, now I think when you're on 18, you start I, getting. I think I am starting to see the ads on the internet. So I'm, right. I'm 51. You, you, oh, no, you're you're going to be bombarded. And, and you know, they want, they want, all, they want you to do lots of things, but they, their premise is that it's okay. You really, age isn't just a number. It's, you're not really getting older. There's no limitations, you know, and, and it's, you know, not true. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you, so it's so funny because I think it is a stand-up style joke the way you put it. Like, you know, they say, "Oh, life begins at sixty-five," and you're like, "Nope, you have to retire as a pilot <laughs> at sixty-five. Well, my my joke in there is like, you know, you want to get on a plane to camp says, "Well, we reached a comfortable cruising altitude." Oh no, wait, we're still on a run- <laughs> runway, you know. And and uh, you don't want your pilot to be eighty. You don't. I mean, right, or your I'm, brain I'm old, and I don't want my pilot to be my age. You know, I'm right. seventy one. I want a, I want a younger than me person being the pilot of the plane. So um, there's a, there's a certain element of bullshit to the ARP uh, philosophy. But 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 again, though, there's kind of like the premise, which is ARP is wrong and aging sucks. And uh, then you have sort of a punchline in there, which is. They say, you know, you could do anything at 65. No, nope. an airline pilot has to retire at 65. So clearly they're wrong. And then there's an act out. You could pretend to be the pilot. And I mean, it's perfect. You say I'm doing, comedy st- I'm doing stand-up comedy in the book. Yeah. But you know, I have learned over the years, um, cause like if you write, you also talk, you have to go to bookstore sign, you know, and, yeah. and if you're writing humor books, you want to be funny when you talk. And I've learned that, um, a remarkable amount of stuff that works great on the page isn't necessarily going to be great in in spoken humor, and sometimes stuff that is really funny when you say it really doesn't work that well on the page. It's true because on stand up, uh, cadence is also important, and your Critical. facial expressions and so on. It, you know, you could sometimes say something completely not funny on stage, but if your cadence is just right, if you're if you're if if the tone of your voice is a little bit like not expected, then people will la- they're like trained to laugh at that cadence. Yeah. So that's that's funny. But it, but it's also hard. You still need the economy of words. Like you put it in one interview with you had a really great podcast with Tyler Cohen, who's a, a friend of mine, uh, where you still need that economy of words, and you need to you need to put the funny stuff at the end. It like with like with a a, a, a stand up comic joke. The, the funniest word should be the last word. Yeah, and, th- and this is a simple rule of comedy that I think everyone, in theory, knows. And in, in written humor, anyway, people violate that rule all the time. I get these, you know, things people send me that, do you think this is funny? And it's either like one premise kind of overdone ridic- to a ridiculous degree, or there is a joke in there, but then there's like 38 words after the end of the joke. Yeah. And what, you know, that's like if you were a comic and people are laughing and you're still talking, you know, you just don't do that. You let them laugh. Yeah, no, very true. And that's why I think the way you particularly write comedy, and I, and I want to get into kind of the details of the book, but I'm also fascinated by the process of of, of humor and comedy and, and writing. The way you do it has a very stand-up flavor. Like later on when you're... T- saying your jokes about Facebook. I was again, laughing out loud. Like, you know, we've, how we've sort of, you know, 
trimmed away at emotions so that they're now just emojis. <laughs> you can have five five emotions on yeah. Facebook. <laughs> right. And, and laugh, that, sad, love, like, or what happy or something like that. Yeah. These are your emotions on Facebook and you're confined to those. Yeah, and 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 language does actually, you know, create your internal emotions. So when you start limiting language to emojis, which is what a lot of kids do, that might be the emo the only emotions our kids grow up with. <laughs> now I sometimes find myself having a debate when I'm reading something on Facebook. Do I like that or do I love that? I don't really love that, but maybe I should put a heart there anyway, you know, to make that person feel better. Yeah. You know, I don't go through that kind of, that kind of thinking when I'm just talking to people. You know what I always think? I when someone says, like there's a lot of Facebook posts of happy posts, but there's also the sad one, like, you know, someone you vaguely know, their grandmother passed away. And, and you blah, make blah, a little blah. sad face. Right. And so I, my, my, my gut instinct <laughs> is to put the sad face, but then I'm thinking it's not enough. Right. Like I should, if I really know the person, I should write a message. I'm sorry for your loss. No, so, just put a sad face. Like <laughs> Holocaust, sad face. Right. <laughs> I, I was think I was thinking once of someone I vaguely knew, I didn't really know. Um, said, oh, you know, my sweet booby, like she passed away, you know, 99 years old. And I was, I was thinking, I was about to do the sad face and I was thinking of, of saying, you know, that I can't do that. That's like so unemotional and impersonal. It's just like, it's like a joke. So I was thinking of just writing, you know, um, she deserved it. <laughs> and because obviously it's a joke and I'm showing that I'm not just going to put some blanket emoji. Then and you have to put a sarcasm face. Right, that's right. So they uh, know. Otherwise, people get they, mad. they get furious. They yeah, get, you can't. You can't do that. I right. mean, unless it's somebody who really gets you. Well, well, and one, you don't care what anybody else thinks. One of your lessons in this, and I don't, I don't think it's in the same chapter. One of your lessons is, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to misword it, but try not to be angry so much. You know, you're giving you're, it, this. This is sort of a humor book uh, posing to be a self help book. So there's actual life lessons, but you know, don't be so angry so much. And every day, I, I. I, I have this urge. I, I, I better respond to this anonymous stranger on oh, oh. Twitter who just said something bad about me that I need to correct. Yeah. Like, and I, I, this morning I'm preparing for you and I'm like, oh, I'm just going to check my notifications about me, of course. And someone said something, you know, wrong, something yeah, wrong, something wrong about me, something actually inaccurate and wrong and insulting. And so I, I didn't want to tweet publicly, so I pulled up his page, hit message, and I was about to respond when I was like, didn't Dave Barry just say, say let it go. <laughs> try to be angry less? So, and I'm not even an angry type of person. It's like if, if the internet was cr wasn't created, I probably never would be angry, or maybe I'd did, find did some other outlet. There's, there's a really great cartoon that sort of sums it all up, and it's a woman, and she's trying to get her husband to go to bed, and he's, he's going, I can't go to bed now. Someone is wrong yeah, on yeah. the internet. <laughs> Yeah, and it's like, and the internet is apparently designed to make us care about people we shouldn't care about and yeah. what they think. But you know, it's really hard, especially if in, you're in the public eye. I mean, I used to get, when I wrote a weekly uh, humor con, I used to get the most ridiculous mail. I learned over the years to enjoy it, even the really angry people. But at first it, you know, it was like, I would write a column and say that, you know, the, the, a great sight to see in Paris is the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And it's a joke. It's a joke. And I would get so much mail from people, not just correcting me, but pompously correcting me about how the Leaning Tower piece, of, you know, perhaps, I don't know how they decide who to hire to write your newspaper column, mister, but you should do a little research for, you know, like, and I used to, at first I would respond by saying, it's a humor column, idiot, don't you? Then I learned to get, you know, to sort of enjoy it. And I would write back and say, um, no, the Leaning Tower pizza was moved to Paris in 1993, <laughs> you know, just because you really can't change them. You can't make humor impaired people right. suddenly have a sense of humor and you can't make stupid people smart and you can't make assholes not be assholes. You can't. So right. you, 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 you either can like enjoy them or just ignore them. But those are your best two options. Confronting them is not a good option. You can't make stupid people smart. I want to write that down. <laughs> Cause you're so right. That is true. You didn't it, know, you're just finding this out now. <laughs> yes, I am. Cause I always want to <laughs> make them smarter. No. Um, like 
What I, what I sometimes I do you that, do you confront people? I mean, uh, like in public, no. in, like in, in a okay. The example the example I give in my book that's the, something that just infuriates me, and I, I I wrote about it, and I say let go of your anger, and if it happened to me today, I'd still get furious. Is like you're in an ice cream line, and they give samples. You know, the kind of like a instead of a, just a plain old ice cream store. Now, of course, it has a, 93 flavors, and they all have cute names, and they give you a little spoon, and you can taste a little taste. You know, and it, and it's okay. If nobody's in the store, I don't care how many you taste. But if I'm in a line behind you and like there's 15 of us waiting, you cannot take you know one and then try it again and to ask your friend to try it and then say, "Can I try that one again?" You can't do that. It's you know it's wrong and you should be shot. Somebody should come and shoot you. And no jury in the land would convict well, you if I'm on that jury. Okay, you do you do you confront people in that? I never do. I just see and then maybe write about it later on. See, I never do. But I don't necessarily seethe about that either. And so here's an interesting point about humor. And I got to remember, there's, there's, there's a fork in the road here because it's something I want to get back to. But uh, I don't really give a shit about most things. But this is what I'm wondering. And I, I wonder this from a comedic point of view and from a humorous point of view. Like, you know, you seethe about this. I don't. But this gives you content for something humorous. Right, exactly. Right? So I have to dig a little differently for, well, for how humor. do you react if you if you're seeing that behavior and it's and it's inconveniencing you granted it's minor inconvenience but it's still what do you do i, I you don't just, get mad you know i don't really care i get mad when somebody is wrong about me and is insulting me but even then i kind of try really hard to do what you did like just to, to roll with it even though this morning i was like angry enough i almost responded but uh you know even when i'm angry it's like someone writes to me something like crazy like i should be shot or whatever and i'll just respond with a question mark and then they'll write back with like a, a whole explanation of why they're angry and i'll respond with two question marks and i try to see <laughs> how many question marks i can go i've gotten up to five question marks and finally they said i see what you're doing fuck you and <laughs> well okay, and then that's a very passive on. aggressive yeah so you're not seething but you're still mad you're mad enough to be yes hostile yes. you're right, right. That, okay but 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 i but the question about seething you know so so let me, I'm going to finish the intro with you, which is you, you've written something like 50 books. You know, one of your books was made into a, a movie, maybe, maybe more. A book was made into a hit Broadway show. You had a, a TV show uh, based on, on your life, Dave's World, that ran for, for four years or five years. Uh, uh, you, you, you had a syndicated column to 400 newspapers for, for what, like 20 years, 23 years, something yeah. like that. And you've had this huge, amazing career basically the dream life all about being funny and telling jokes uh so so i want to get back to the arc of your career in a second but in terms of the the seething leading you know the, the being angry being being inconvenienced leading to humor they say a lot of comedy comes from some some you know dark place inside and you know you, you you've had a, a troubled early family life um you know, I don't know how much you talk about it, but, you know, dad, alcoholic, your mom, um, who you say was extremely funny, but had a dark edge. She sadly uh, ended up uh, killing herself. You've had all sorts of troubles and, and some troubles even in, in your last book we'll talk about. But do you think that led to you uh, this defense mechanism where you had to kind of deal with troubles with humor? No. Okay. I get no. Yes. I, I, no. No. <laughs> I mean, it, question it's and, a grill. No, it's a really good question, and I get asked that, and, and so I've had a lot of time to think about it over the years. And everything you say is true. I just want to correct one thing about my dad. He he was an alcoholic. My dad suffered from alcoholism. He was a really good man, and he got into alcoholic an Alcoholics Anonymous, and he spent the rest of his life okay. doing good. You know, he was a great guy and a, and a and a pretty stable human being who had that problem and overcame it or dealt with it. Like alcoholics don't say they overcome it, but he recovered or whatever they say and he, he, he was sober sober and he was a great guy and you know he was a good dad and my mom did commit suicide and she was an unhappy but she had to she suffered from depression she was also the funniest person i've ever met in my life so those things were true and yet uh and maybe this is just some kind of denial on my part um my childhood was really happy i mean my dad's drinking didn't start till i was out of college and it ended after a few years and he was fine. My mom did have that issue and we all dealt with it, but it, it, at the same time, I loved being around my mom. I mean, she was hilarious. I loved when I, you know, whatever I got to see her. So my memories of my childhood are that I, I was really happy and I was in a family where everybody, especially my two parents, was really pretty funny. And um, 
I had no, I was not athletic. I was little. I, I, you know, didn't get to puberty till I was like probably close to 40. So I was like a slow <laughs> developing and I wanted to be popular and I wanted my, you know, kids to like me. And I was really good at this one thing, which was making them laugh and being, you know, and, 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 and in a subversive way that was, um, you know, that worked really well, especially when you're in a discipline intensive environment like school where there's teachers and rules and stuff like that. I was a kid who was really good at a doing well in that environment, you know, but by, by doing it by kind of undermining everything that was going on in a way that my friends could appreciate and enjoy. So I, I often get it because you're unhappy. And I know so many comedians who are, you know, more than I do, but there's not a lot of happy stand-up comedians. Like, no, although, least, although I'm happy and there you go, uh, you know, I've had, but you're probably a shitty comedian. So it's, you know, <laughs> it's true. Yeah. But I, I, I guess I had 20 years of adulthood where I was successful. No, miserable. Oh, oh. <laughs> and so maybe I kind of feel that fueled it a little, uh, my childhood was pretty happy. Although similar to you, I was, uh, you make, uh, I think it was a, com no, not in this book, maybe two books before, uh, no, no high school virgin, um, ever says, uh, I want to lose my virginity to the captain of the chess team. Yeah, so, right. so, so it's like, basically, yeah. I was captain of the chess team. Right. So I related to all of those. I, I wanted, <laughs> I wanted girls to like me and I wanted guys to like me and the girls weren't going to like me because of how I looked or because I was, you know, a great athlete and the guys weren't going to like me because, you know, because I was, you know, good at anything, but I was funny and people like a funny person. So I, that was my, um, incentive to be funny more than any sense of like the world has been wrong to me and I, and I need to get it out somehow. So I'm going to get it out that way. I, I also like I had a good childhood. I had, you know, if I, if I was like, I had a good, happy life compared, especially to God, like keep going. I, I'm just, I've known some comedians who, who yeah. have terrible lives. Yeah. You know, they were funny as hell. And they, well, classic cases, Richard Pryor, you know, grew up in a brothel, didn't know his dad was, and just was, you know, had a horrific life and turned it into humor yeah. or rich. I don't know if you knew rich Jenny. He was a friend of mine, yeah, yeah. you know, he's a brilliant comedian, you know, and, but I, I, it turns out desperately unhappy. So I'm, I'm glad I, I did that. That's not where I came from. That's not how it happened for me. It happened to me. Cause I really just think, cause I have funny parents and I learned a skill. Um, and right. I, you, you spend time, you figured, okay, I'm not gonna, I, I kind of feel like the entire basis of the, the entire growth of civilization is, uh, men wanting to attract women. <laughs> yes, so yeah. they build bridges and buildings and, uh, <laughs> and I couldn't do those things. I mean, you know, I, like I always say, if, if, uh, if we go, if we have an, a nuclear war and we revert, you know, humorists are going to be the ones, you know, the, the guys who are going to survive are the guys out there, you know, right now fixing the sidewalk the guys, humorists will be passing through the digestive systems of the wolves. You know, we, <laughs> we're not going to, we're not going to make it. But we don't have that useful skill, but we did later on, you know, when civilization got advanced enough to appreciate humor, that's, that's where we began to shine. I, I would actually disagree with that or else we wouldn't exist. Like the, our humorous ancestors. What, you're going to claim that humorous built the society. Built no, them. but I'm going to say that, um, uh, humorists, uh, even in caveman days, uh, uh just like artists in caveman days, you, you know, didn't have to be the alpha male to attract women. They, Do you have any proof of all, at all there were yeah, humorous yeah. and Dar Dar Darwin had the, his theory of natural selection, but he also had his little known, and this is true theory of sexual selection, which says that the artists of a tribe w were basically saying they were so far above the alpha male, oh. they didn't need to do the hunting and get and stuff I'm like that. Darwin was kind of a wimpy looking guy <laughs> come up, to come up with that theory. <laughs> and and he, mar he married his cousin, which was probably had to like second guess whether he needed to write his <laughs> theories, you know, um, should I do this? Like, they're going to think our kids are in trouble. Yeah. Well, I'm not buying it. I don't think there were a lot of comedians in the caves. I'm just thinking those would be the first guys to get, you know, shoved out. So, so I want, I wanted to, I wanted to, you know, and again, I keep saying, I want to talk about your book lessons from Lucy. Well, you know what? You all you do is mention it every now and then as you're That's doing it. Do. We don't ever have to talk about that. No, book. no. There are some things you say in there that I, that I really want to talk about, but it's, it strikes me just from reading so many, so much of your stuff through the years that there, I don't want to say there's a formula to your writing, but it seems like you're either self-deprecating. So you make the self-deprecating point, you make that funny, and then you make an example, which is a huge exaggeration. Like for instance, you didn't lose your, you, first you said, 
I didn't lose my puberty till late. I was 40, yeah. <laughs> you know, so you, so you make the, po the premise and then there's either a punchline after that. And then there's a further one, which is the, a, a huge exaggeration. You do that repeatedly throughout all your books, the exaggeration or, or the incongruity. Like this is about as interesting as a hypotenuse. Like where'd you come up with the word hypotenuse? Like just this incongruity is like an, a, a kind of a form of exaggeration. And then the other thing you do is you find you, you're a great observant of the ridiculous, which I'll put inconvenience under that category. Like the, like the person who's taking 15, you know, spoonfuls of a sample when there's a huge line behind them. So, 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 and then you'll, you'll point that that's the premise. You'll make a joke about it. And the joke might be a sample dialogue you're having with that person. You know, you're very good with those. And then there'll be an exaggeration. Like, you know, what if we were, you're giving it, you're giving away a Nelly. Everybody's going to go out and write humor books now. <laughs> no, no. Cause I think giving it away. My, no, I'm kidding. It, right. The thing is, even though, if, even if that is a formula, which I'm just v broadly, broadly generalizing, like there's a lot more to it, but even then it's hard to find the examples to fill out that formula. That's the hard part. Uh, but would you say that's, you know, that's yeah, that those are two key, uh, modes of humor that I use. Another one is what I call the false authority. When I, when I, I loved writing for newspapers because there's no more kind of pompous form of writing than, you know, like the New York times, the Washington post declaring to the, to the world, here's the truth. We know the truth because we're journalists. And of course I've worked in the newspaper business for years. So I, I've seen how the sausage is made and you know, they're not really authorities for the most part, but they write, there's a certain style of writing. And I love to assume the mantle of the authority in a, and especially when it's writing in a newspaper, this is where I would really get the mail from the angry humor impaired people who, who cannot can, you know, process the idea that something written in a newspaper isn't literally true or, or intended to be true. Like I, for years, I, one of my favorite columns is what's called ask Mr. Language person. And it was a grammar expert like William Sapphire is what I patterned it after. And he would, Mr. Language person would answer your, your questions. Of course, I made up the questions and I made up the answers. And every question and every answer was ludicrous. And the answers particularly were possibly wrong. <clears throat> so it'd be like a, a column filled with grammatical and spelling and, and every other kind of mistakes. And I would get this mail uh, from teachers, teachers that would say, you know, perhaps you didn't notice this, but in this column, and they would have cut the column out and send it back to me, you made an error. And in this forest of, you know, 50, 70, 100 mistakes, they'd have found one and <laughs> circled it and sent it into me, you know. But anyway, I loved being so, so, the so pony wait, what, authority. What, what would you tell, what, I, I'm trying to understand, like you're not just making fun of people's grammar mistakes, you're writing a grammar column where you're making Where everything would be incorrect. Every it, single thing in it would be wrong. It was a parody of, uh, really was a parody of a guy named William Sapphire yeah. who wrote a column on language. Which, by the way, I love that column. William I did Sapphire too. And I, not only did I love it, I, I loved that William Sapphire loved Mr. Language Person and I got to know him. Uh, and for once, uh, one of the questions to like Mr. Language Person was, what what exactly does the Lone, Lone Ranger say? Does he say, hi-ho, silver away? Or I can't remember. Or hi-yo. It was, it, was it, is it hi-ho, silver? Or hi-yo, silver? This is the kind of question. Mm -hmm. Mr. Language person would address. And I called up um, <laughs> William Sapphire. I had gotten his number over the years and he picked it up and said, Bill Sapphire, I said, this day, Barry. He goes, yeah. And I goes, hi, ho, silver or hi, yo, silver. He goes, hi, ho, silver. And he hangs. <laughs> 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 no, it was actually hi, yo. God, I can't remember now. Whatever it was, William Sapphire told Mr. Language person to correct me. And then I would write a whole thing about William Sapphire coming in, weighing in on it. But can we necessarily accept his judgment on this question? You know, that kind of, that was the, the column. So, 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 so the premise of a, of a false authority joke is that you would be largely true. It wouldn't be. No, you'd be utterly, completely wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was always quoting scientists who didn't exist and organizations okay. that didn't exist. And, you know, and, and you know, like, you know, can, how can we explain why people are, young people are eating Tide Pods? And, you know, I would quote some uh, th psychiatric authorities saying, we just think they're stupid, you know, that kind of authority. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to have to play around with that. And then, uh, okay, so we have three things now. Well, we you have... don't have to use that one because no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm I may have a lot of trouble explaining it to you. I can tell. No, no, but it's I'm, I'm not I'm that complicated. That. <laughs> they pretend to be authorities, but they're wrong. They are not right. They are wrong, yet they think they're right or we're pretending they're right.
but you've run for president. Oh, you've yeah. quote unquote run for president. I'm and always you would, say, for... you would say you were a leading candidate. Yeah, for president. yeah, yeah. I would always. So lie, that's but... that's the, using the false authority. Yes, yes, yeah. Oh, also, you could just call it lying, but right. lying in a newspaper because that's really the authority is the the you you've got the whole you know voice of whatever paper you're in behind you. The, everything else they put in there is supposed to help you and make you smarter and teach you more. And here's this one guy coming along trying to make you stupider by lying to you. Right, like you're piggybacking on the brand of the you newspaper. Know, yeah. the, their, their truth. I'm, I'm taking on the mantle of authority that newspapers present. And it, it's a, the, a part of the, like, the, this is getting meta, but you know, newspapers really aren't that authoritative. If you've ever spent any time around journalists, you know, they don't really know very much about anything. They're English majors. So they call up one expert and he tells them something which they only kind of half understand and they write it down. And they maybe call up another expert and, and that's like their sources. They don't really know what they're talking about half the time, but they're writing the story in the newspaper. No, it, it's true. Like I used to um, work for a bunch of newspapers as well. And uh, once I stopped being in that industry completely, I never read a newspaper again. <laughs> I, I, and I no longer... I don't think I've read a newspaper in about six years. And sometimes I'm occasionally called to go on TV to discuss some issue. I don't, I don't prepare at all because I know news reading the news will not prepare me, but just, you know, from like people's conversations, what's important or not. And then when you're presented, you can give an opinion just as good as anybody else. So that's, and the fact that you're on television already gives you, well, yeah. right. Michael Crichton wrote, I cannot remember, I'm, I'm feeling stupid here. He named this phenomenon. He called it, he said, if you've ever been quoted in a newspaper or, or had a newspaper story done about you or about something you know very well, you will know immediately that it's full of errors. Right. Like, every, you know, almost everything is wrong in any uh, any story so where you really point. know it. So, and, and so when you read that, you go, this is ridiculous, this is wrong. He said, and then you turn the page of the newspaper and read what it has to say about the Middle East or the economy, and you believe that. Right. The same newspaper. And he, 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 he I'm, I'm feeling stupid, and I'm sure people listening will say, it's the blank effect. But Michael Crichton named it. He said, why do we believe what authorities tell us about anything else when we, we know they're wrong about what they tell us about what we know about? So, do you ever read his memoir, Travels? Oh, Michael Crichton? Yeah. No. Oh, so beautiful. You I love that, the way that guy wrote. He yeah. was a genius. This, this one memoir he kind of sucks you in into this concept that he really wants to explore. But first starting off with, you know, I was a medical student, then here's how I got into writing. So you feel like it's a real memoir. And then he sucks you into this amazing journey that he, that he goes on. Oh, I got to read. Do you, do you remember the name of it? Travels. Travels. Okay. Yeah. I will get that. Um, so, so, so. I'm going to okay. get it right now while, while you're talking. I'm just going to download <laughs> you, it. Steve, can no, you? No, kidding, kidding. Amazon. Like, also, is it the Gelman uh, or Gelman amnesia effect. Or something. Gel, that's it. The, the Gelman, Gelman yeah. amnesia effect. That's a great the, name. I knew that. I didn't look it up. Thank you. Uh, I knew it was a I, thing. Steve, Steve was a, a news producer, so he knows this very well. No, but I can't, I'm kidding. But I do know about not people not being experts. I know <laughs> nothing. These days, we're all investors trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if 
one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But People in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180-plus Masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180-plus Masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So... This holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. So one one thing I noticed, again, and this is more in the um, you find something ridiculous or, or slash inconvenient, and then you you make fun of it, then you exaggerate to an extreme. Um, there's a certain muscle that notices the ridiculous. I think not everyone notices the ridiculous around them. Like like, And just as an example, sometimes I see a stand-up comedian walk onto a stage, and you can see their eyes looking around, and they're quickly like, why are we... Um, in the basement of some bar and there's disco balls. Like, what was happening here? You know, they'll kind of find the ridiculous things right away. Or like, sir, why are you wearing your shirt inside out? You know, whatever. And uh, uh, it's a muscle, I think, that takes practice. And you've been writing comedy for 50 years. You've, you've, that's why I say just knowing the formula is not enough. But how how would you say, am, am, I, am I speaking too generally? Do you ever, have you ever thought of it this way? But like, how do you practice this ridiculous muscle? No, you're absolutely right. Um, I think what a lot of comics do and, and humor writers do, 
you observe something that everyone else sees and everyone else already knows. I mean, I always think the the heart of, of humor isn't so much telling people something they never thought of or don't know. It's telling them something they already, they really do know and just haven't kind of paid attention to. But I mean, simple thing like nobody really knows why airplanes can take off. You know, no, no, you know, ex- there may be like a couple of guys at Boeing who could actually explain it to you. But most of us, we, you know, if you were to just not tell us it could happen and go show us an airplane, we would say, what? You're not, but we cheerfully get on them and, you know, just assume that there's some, somebody up there. Comedians will, will use that fear that, you know, that you really don't have any idea how the, how this works or if it's going to work this time, just because it worked the other or what they're really doing up there in the front of the, of the air. They're probably going, right. oh, Jesus. And then, you know, um, so yeah, there's, there's a, uh, a, it's a simple observational skill, but, but, but you're right. Like everybody, when you say that it's like, okay, yeah, you're right. But I never thought that before that nobody, that I don't even know how a plane works. Right. <laughs> like the Wright brothers know, and that's it. <laughs> and, but we're, we're not afraid for the most part of getting on planes. Cause every, everyone else pretends to, yeah, sure. This gigantic heavy thing, which they've just loaded all this crap onto and us and food for us. Sure. It's just going to roll down there and fly. Um, I think because we all we all trust that everyone else agrees that it's going to happen, we shouldn't worry about it. And the comic comes along and says, "Why in the world do we think this is going to work? Why is you know what what are we thinking?" Um, that's kind of probing that fear is a is a is a is a major source of humor. Not necessarily. I'm not doing a great job with the airplane because I haven't thought about it that much. But, but I I would. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. Louis C.K. sort of makes a joke about the plane concept about the awesomeness of flying. Like, and so he, he's making someone. I've heard that and it's really wonderful. And yeah. he's right. Like, wait, what we, you, you're, you know, people are upset because their flight was like a half an hour late. You just got in this tube and went from New York to LA yeah. like, in like, six hours. Like a Greek God. Yeah, yeah. Like you were in a, in a chair that flew through space. <laughs> or your, your plane does, your phone doesn't get, you know, right Wait. away. It doesn't get the picture you're waiting for. It's, well, it has to go to space. Yeah. You know? Would you give it a minute? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it, it's just observing something that everyone is taking for granted, and and but that's hard though. How do you practice observing that? Because again, like it's, we're, I, we're I, used to. As Seinfeld even talks about this, he says everyone goes into a room and looks for what's right, whereas the comedian or a humorist goes into a room and looks for what's wrong. Yeah. And so you have to kind of really practice that over and over again, looking for what's wrong, because you want to see only that what's right. Yes, I mean, I I'm not. I don't even add anything to that because that is exactly what comedians are doing. They're constantly finding. Everybody wants the world to be rational. Everybody wants there to be a, an explanation for things. And yet, it's so irrational. And, and like it's you, completely irrational. Yeah. And it's crazy. And you're going to die at the end of it. And meanwhile, a lot of your friends are going to die. And some of them are going to die in horrible ways. All of these things are horrible. All of them. And we're in this world where all these horrible things are happening. Not just occasionally. They're happening all the time. And you will die for sure at the end. So what do we do? We have two reactions to that. One of them is religion. It's really okay because God wants it to be this right, way. God something, fills in all the holes. Something <laughs> bad is happening because there's God has a reason for that. Don't worry. And you don't really die. You really don't die. And you're going to see your mom again everything. That's one reaction, religion. And the other is humor, which is for some weird reason, no other animal does this. We evolve this ability to go, ha, 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 that's funny. It's not really funny. It's terrifying, you know, that if you, when you think about it, that you're going to die or that the plane might not take off. But you, you know, we have this comfortable, we have this way of psychically dealing with it so we don't go completely insane. Animals deal with it by not thinking about it. You know, it right. never occurs to a dog or a coyote that anything would be any different. Right. And no, they know it's hard out there. They know they better eat the food right now. Or the other coyote is going to get it. They know they better run from that animal because it'll kill them. They just don't worry about it because that's the way it is. We worry about it. Think about it. Why is it that way? Why shouldn't it be another way? Is it really fair? And then I guess when you're thinking about fairness or, or irrational stuff, trying to convert that into humor becomes a source of a lot of what you write. But what you just said about animals segues perfectly into Lessons from Lucy, your most recent <laughs> book, Page Turner. Uh, for again, sale, for sale in bookstores. For sale or in bookstores as of like yesterday. Yeah. So I had an advanced copy, but I also bought my, I also got my bought copy from Amazon yesterday. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I always, I always feel authors should get paid. So I never just get the advanced also, copy. Also, you gave me, can I tell the our audience what you gave me? 
Yes. Yeah. I mean, I don't. This is gave you a one. gift before the podcast. A two hundred and fifty dinar dinar yeah. note from Iraq with okay. a picture of Saddam Hussein on it. No longer in circulation in Iraq, I might add. <laughs> I, this is like the, the, the cheesiest. I'm surprised even when it was freshly printed, anybody ever took it. It's this cheesiest looking money I've ever seen. But. I'm so grateful. I, I I have an idea. Let me just tell you this idea. I want to go to every like coffee deli or whatever, order coffee, and then they charge me, you know, a dollar fifty. And I reach in my pockets. I'm like, oh shit! All I've got I is these dinars. I don't have any. I forgot to bring my cash. Can you take this dinar? And I want to see how many people will get paid in Saddam Hussein currency. I, that would actually be that would be a good idea. Um, the answer probably is zero because people just you know they're kind of serious but that if, a, if you had a really funny person they would say yes because actually it's probably worth more than a yeah. cup of coffee don't you think probably okay. yes yeah but anyway. yeah but um so so okay the stuff about animals does segue into your lessons from lucy um you kind of uh uh you know at 70 you want to make sure you enjoy the rest of your your dwindling life <laughs> and uh you you basically learn from Lucy's ability to essentially live in the moment and all the benefits that come from a dog just being happy and lovable and living in the moment, you translate that into human ease. And of course, then it's not about dogs, but it's all the things in your life and all the humorous things you notice. But the, the, the first lesson really resonated with me, that which is that you wanted to have more friends. And I, I, I think about this to the point where I ask my therapist about this. Like, as a kid, of course, we have friends, and when, you know, you have friends that even knock on your door and say, hey, how's it going? Well, let's go out. And you just hang out. Yeah. You like have sleepovers. Right. I mean, like it almost seems weird, but but why does it become strange? Why did, why? I mean, when I was a kid, it, the most fun thing I could do is like Neil Thompson, who is my best friend, lived down the street. Hey, can, can Neil sleep over tonight? Yeah. Yeah. And we were so excited about it, even though we saw each other all the time, all day, every day. It was just like an exciting thing to do. And then at some point, we just totally lose that joy in another person's, you know, and, and companionship. Yet, and yet friendship and connection are keys to, are, are correlated with longevity. Like, uh, maybe I'm being a false authority. My but wife will live to be 700 years old, if that's true. Cause she has like, she has more, she makes more friends in a day than I have in my, you know, my entire life. She's so friendly. And, and like friends to the, I sort of feel like friends to the point where they can, she can just call up anytime and say, Hey, how's it going? That's what they do. Yeah. That's what, I mean, I do generalize about this men versus women, but w w my wife can, you know, have not seen somebody for an hour and they'll see each other. And then they will recount that hour and, and, and it takes them longer than dental school to go over just you know, what the, the, you know, and I can't do that. If I see somebody I haven't seen in 25 years, I can be caught up in 30 seconds. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. So you're not dead. And how are your kids? You know, and yeah, they're good. Good. The kids are good. My wife would never settle for the kids are good. You know, that each kid would be a long detailed discussion with many side roads before we got back to the main key and then the next kid and the next kid. And, and I can't do that. I don't do that. And so, so how many friends, Four. Uh, I have four friends. You have four friends. <laughs> Is that really true? That I know of that are alive. Yeah. And so by by that, no, I, I probably more than. But I I'm, I I literally have four guys I consider really close friends that you can call up and say anything. But I don't. I don't call them. And then, then one of them. There's one guy I call and he calls me. And I only call him because he calls me. I feel guilty that I I should call him too. And they're friends outside of anything you do yeah like yeah they're just friends it's not like most Stephen of them King, like hey how's it going oh well, steve yeah he's like i mean he's always calling me but i don't answer yeah. <laughs> no no i do consider him a friend but close friends really close friends i only have a few. and how many do you think one should have like you say you want more i do i don't know i don't know if there's a good answer for that but i do think i should have more i think i should do more pe things with guys than i do do you know like but but do you ever like like I had a situation where you can't be friends with women though. I've learned that because it, it's a problem because your wife doesn't like it. Yeah. Your wife doesn't like it when I have friends with women. No, <laughs> no. I mean, my wife. That was funny. Yeah. Wordplay. Uh, yeah, a fourth, just, a fourth little, technique. Hey, just tossing it out there. <laughs> Add that to your list of things. Misdirect, misdirection. Yeah. Um, any, no, I can't remember. Oh yeah. Um, it is hard to have friends with women and it just be friends. Everybody just knows about this issue. I think. Um, so it's, I'm limiting it to guys, but I wish I had more guy friends that, um, but, but, but part of the problem is I don't want them. 
<laughs> you know? Right. Well, that's just. I, 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 was, hang I just want to be alone. You know. I was about to ask, like, like I had a situation recently where someone I thought, oh, maybe I could be friends with this person. He and his wife said, "Hey, can you and your wife go out to dinner?" And like, I I suddenly realized, like, with every fiber in my body, I did not want to go to dinner. I did not want to leave my apartment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And like, have conversation. No, it's too much work. Tired. I yeah. know. I get, and I could watch Netflix if I stay. Right. You know. Oh no, it's really overpowering, and it gets worse and worse and worse. And then you know, I cast my mind back to, you know, just even like, well, high school, college. I knew a lot of guys. We did a lot of stuff. Where. You know, and so maybe good friends are, are not necessary, but maybe just guys a lot of acquaintances you hang out with. <laughs> well, but, but do you hang out? Do you like say, "Oh, honey, poker night"? I'm going out. Like I don't even do that. <laughs> no, I would never get or away. Or she would have to. I go. would never get away with that. I don't even know how to play poker. She <laughs> she would the first thing you'd say, "What's a flush?" And I go, "I don't know." It's <laughs> you know, I would make a toilet joke. And so <laughs> it's yeah, it's it's hard, and and but it's it's a big it's a big issue for me, and it's like um, I think a lot of older guys. I think it's an older guy issue. Where you you kind of become more isolated, and uh, and I I actually talk in the book about it's, it's, I do do some group activity things. I'm in a, a rock band, which is kind of it's we're bad, but we get together. Did you haven't played since 2015? Well, we're playing in May. Okay, yeah. where? And we uh, we're playing in Minneapolis in May. But um, okay, this guy, I'll drop the name Stephen King. Well, we already dropped that name. He's in the band, and so is Ridley Pearson, and so is uh, Greg Isles, and a bunch of other people. Mitch Album, Scott Turow, Amy Tan, Scott Amy Tarot, yeah. Tan, yeah. But so we're playing in May, and it's kind of my idea, and it was partly because of this book. It's like I'm going to do fun things with people, um, right? And, which is another lesson: don't stop having fun. Don't stop the having second fun. lesson. Yeah, there you go. And, and like dogs don't like dogs never think it's too. They never get too old to to run after the ball. You know that's fun. They're going to keep doing it. It's not like we've got, I can't do that anymore. Well, I'm not run after the ball, but you think you're like, you're too old to, to do th things that you actually enjoy, but they just don't seem age appropriate anymore. Well, this is what my example, I'm in this band and we're going to, we're going to play in May, but Steven hasn't played with us for a while. And uh, so he wants to practice, which is not really our style. We're, we're not the kind of band that practices ahead of time. Right, so, and you didn't drop this name, but Bruce Springsteen advised you not to get any better. Exactly. <laughs> Bruce Springsteen played with us once, and he, he, was his, his exact words were, don't get any better, because then you'll just be another shitty band. Yeah. Um, and, but but we, we still play. So anyway, st we don't really practice. We, what we, we, we play, and then we say, we should have practiced. That's kind of our style. And, um, but Steven hasn't played with us in a long time, so he wanted to at least know what songs are we going to do and what are the chords. I'm not saying he can play the chords. I'm saying he wants to know them, <laughs> all right? So we met in January at his house, me, Ridley, Greg Isles, and Stephen King, and we practiced for two days in Stephen King's garage, and it was great. It was That uh, was and, fun. And at night, we went out to dinner, and then we went back and practiced some more, and we're terrible, and it was just four guys in a garage, uh, and he has a really nice garage. So so what anyway. what advice would you give to listeners or to even to me, like, I like sitting at home watching TV. I like playing chess, which I could do online at home. Uh, I like coming here, but it's not. Sometimes you don't meet friends among other. You know, comedians are very anxious about their comedy, and then they go off and do other things. And they always want to know how they did. Yeah, yeah, and it's a little competitive sometimes. Yeah. Oh, a little. <laughs> it's a little competitive between comedians. Yeah, a lot. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm like just they... being. Nice. I'm just being fair to the. <laughs> I own the club, so I can't be mean to, to yeah. anybody. But. Um, uh, what advice would you give? Like, how, how how would you find that compass that directs you to to having more friends? I I don't have like really specific do this do this. I just think if you you need to be aware, especially as you age, that you're going to change in a bad way. You're going to get less social. You're going to get more cranky. You're going to get less in, uh, willing to explore. Less imaginative. Uh, less just. Uh, Spontaneity, spontaneous, spont bleh, less spontaneous, um, and it, it, you need to think about that. Be aware of it to combat it. You know, and if something comes up, like you have an opportunity to go out, yeah, uh, I might not like them. It's uh, it's cold out, whatever. Maybe you should think go anyway, and you know, and I it, did, and it, and was, it was the worst was dinner ever. <laughs> <laughs> Never doing that again. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> so the lesson there is never go out. No, but I do want <laughs> no, to go out with do, those people. I do like people and want to be friends. And then you get into this 
that kind of gray area where you don't know what to do. Well, I, like my daughter played soccer for uh, 14 years from age four to age 18. She was, she played soccer, girls soccer. And I learned, I, it became really an, a great, important part of my life. Partly because I love watching her play soccer, you know, it's my daughter and everything. But also like when you play soccer, like you basically, you're with other parents. You gotta, you know, go to the field, you know, you gotta, you gotta drive to some horrendous town in central Florida and sit in the rain during rain delay. You know, you gotta go to the hotel bar afterwards and, and you spend a lot of time around people you would never know if it weren't for the fact that your daughter and their daughter are on the same team. And it was, it was the kind of thing where I would, if, if, if it weren't for Sophie, I would never know these people. I would not hang around with these people. I but certainly you become friends with them. I became really good friends. Not, not with all of them, but I had many great experiences. I became friends. I miss them because she went away to college and now I don't do that anymore. Um, and I need to find another thing like that where I'm, where for no, for some random reason, I'm with random people. And you know, you, when you get older and more successful as you have, you can choose everything about your life, where you live, who you spend time with, you know, you don't need to meet anybody. You can control that completely in a way you can't, when you're a kid, you got to go to high school with the other high school kids. You don't get to pick who's in your class. You go to college, you don't get to pick who's your classmates are. So, so my takeaway is I should figure out. You should have a daughter who plays soccer. <laughs> I have a daughter who does ballet. That's the same thing, only to, oh, God. Yeah, that's oh, I would the worst myself. experience I would ever. Because <laughs> my daughter at the beginning was doing dance and soccer. Ugh. And I was so like rooting for you soccer over dance. You sit three hours to watch, to watch five one, seconds. And they, and they put one, they do two performances. One's, you know, at about the hour mark and one's about the two hour and yeah. 50 minute mark. And you can't even tell which one is your daughter or half the time out there with all the makeup on. What I do is I sit right outside the, the performance area so I could just read a book. And, and you I, didn't go in to the, watch the show? I'm not watching a bunch of Oh, you mean when it was your daughter's daughter. Yeah. And then I would count in my, I knew when she was on the schedule. So I would just count whenever there was the silence and, the, and applause. And then when it was my, when her turn was up, meaning my turn, I would go in. I and, never died. I never thought of that. Yeah. I sat and watched everybody else's kids no, dance no, badly that's... just so I could watch my own daughter dance badly. Now, but, uh, there's so many other good lessons. Uh, just real quickly, you know, uh, it's all obvious stuff. Try not to judge no, people by their No, nothing in looks. this book people don't already know. It's just, but, but it's hard to like, let go of your anger. It's just people don't do these things. Yeah, let go of your anger. As we discussed, there's people on Facebook, for instance, are so angry at each other all the time. One time I posted a photo of myself with uh, President Clinton. And uh, regardless- How dare of my, you? Yeah, regardless of my politics, like, okay, it's neat to have a photo with a guy who was a former president. I would do President Nixon. I would do- How about Hitler? How yeah. about Hitler? That I probably would not do. All right. Uh, well, he was never president. Just but a little, I wish little information I could do for it, you. But, I, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but immediately I got a hundred, like people would write like, okay, deleted. And- <laughs> uh, like you get so like crazy. <laughs> no, no, and we and it's get, it's getting worse and worse and worse in this yeah, country. Yeah, it's only gonna get worse. Right? I will not talk about politics with anybody anymore. Yeah, because I can't. just don't. I don't need to watch people get angry. Well, well, you make the good point. You know, do it if you're gonna do it. Like, here's some rational facts. I'm happy to discuss it rationally. You, but we, you, you, we can't, you cannot do that anymore. You, you, you have to take a side right away. And you're a good person or a bad person. That's you know, it doesn't matter what your rational yeah. facts are. Which side are you on? And that's all that matters to anybody anymore. And I'm tired of it. Right, I'm just tired of watching people call each other thing. names. Over, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I do want to get to the, the you know, I, I was finishing this book and I was thinking, man, good book. And, you know, then you have the epilogue or read the epilogue, which kind of sums things up. And and I'm not into dogs, but you you make the whole point, analogy with the dogs. And again, it's hardly anything really about dogs. You just make the analogy uh, about your dog, Lucy, and all these lessons and things you need to do and and all the funny anecdotes and experiences and then you have this terrifying and sad and horrific and as a father of four daughters now and another kid uh story about your daughter who in the, you have one last lesson at the very end of the book i think i'm done i'm about to put it down i'll read this last lesson tomorrow and then i start reading it and like oh my god is this what is happening and 
I, I don't even know if you want to go into it or if you want to no, sure. yeah, talk about it. So, so first off, you, uh, I'll just quickly explain. You, your daughter wakes up uh, mostly paralyzed or from the, or paralyzed from the waist down. I say mostly paralyzed. And she's, she's leaving. She's supposed to be leaving for Duke in two, two days. days. You take her to the hospital thinking it's just like a panic attack. You realize, no, this is much more serious. She has some disease that you call transverse, transverse myelitis, which the word transverse sounds funny. I'm almost thinking that's a joke, but you mentioned it no, enough. It was a real joke. It's yeah. not a real joke. No, you joke. say this is like the worst moments of your life. And considering we talked about some of the other horrific things that happened in your life earlier, and obviously with a kid, it's it's the terrifying, it's scary. And you 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 really express that. It's really moving. Um, the feelings for your daughter, your fear at that moment, the advice you have for people who are well-wishing, but but it's just, they don't even realize it comes off wrong. And... Uh, so I just want to ask also, how is Sophie, your daughter, doing now? Because you, you you finish before we she's fully recovered. She's she's recovered, and and um you know with a few minor concerns, but she's a Duke, uh, and she's a happy college student, which is all she wanted to be. So if you I, saw her, you would never know anything happened. You'd see a beautiful girl walking around Duke. Does she feel any pain walking around? Is there any? Could she could she do soccer? She I don't know. Uh, you know she hasn't. She's still in, in in physical recovery, and so she's she's taking you know doing some therapy and stuff. But she's physically fine. As but part of the physical recovery is simply because she was off her fle- she, feet for so long. She was unable to walk, so her, her muscles must have atrophied. Yes. and now she's and there's a lot that. of yeah, a lot of, and a lot of relearning as a result of this disease. She had to relearn how to do a lot of things. And, and the doctor told you it's, uh, the prognosis was third, third, third. So third. Well, that was the recovery. internet told. The doctor wouldn't tell us oh. anything. Oh, the doctor didn't tell you anything. Well, they just they're not they're with this particular disorder. They uh, they don't promise you a thing. Neurologists are very careful about what they say because they don't want to get sued for the most part. But the the, the outcome is. There's no, there's no guarantees, and they don't, and it often does not work out well. But is it the fact that she was young and athletic? Does that help? That helped a lot. It's not the. It, so it, that move from a third to sixty percent. That's what we. That's what we told ourselves. That's what we told Sophie, and that's what you know. She did recover, and she had a positive outlook. She's for- unbelievable. She's the strongest, bravest person I've ever known. I mean, I know she's my daughter, but imagine you're you're eighteen, you're about to go to college, and you can't walk. You're in a wheelchair, and nobody's telling you you ever will walk again. All your friends come to say goodbye, goodbye, Sophie. And then they're off. They're gone to college. And you're seeing, you know, she's on Instagram. She's on, uh, you know, all those whatever they're on. And and she sees all her friends, you know, first day of school, meeting her roommates. Going to, and she's in, a, in an ICU with with tubes in her and and getting transfusions. And doctors, are, you know, saying, we don't know. So the, it's got to be it, scary. It really, she never let her, she never stopped, you know, being positive. She never stopped thanking every doctor who came in even if every nurse gave her a shot she still thanked them and, and she never stopped smiling and, and she she's kept her sense of humor in the middle of the night like i mean when it was dark dark times for us we were just i was crying all when i wasn't with sophie i was crying um and and michelle never left sophie so she was like holding it all in she, she never, for 40 days she slept on a hospital bed but sophie in the middle of the night one night you know three o'clock in the morning says to her mom, you know, she's lying there with all these tubes beeping and she says, you know, this would be a really good college essay. Cause you know, like when they're writing their essays, right. when she wrote her essay, she's like, what am I, they ask you, what's your biggest challenge? She said, what, I've had a good life. I don't have any challenges in here. You know, she had a big challenge, but anyway, that, that was, that's what happened. She's good now. But, but still this is a beautifully written chapter and, and you have some humor in it, but it's also very moving. And, and there's a lesson, which is if you wake up and the sun's out and you're walking, be grateful. And we always tell ourselves that, but we always forget it. Exactly. I will never forget it now. I mean, the, if there's any positive to come out of this, I never will forget what we lost, what we thought we lost. When we thought, you know, because you're a parent, you know, you th- you you think your kid's never going to walk again. You're never going to be happy again. And you know it. You know, your life is over as you knew it. It's going to be a different life. And when, if you had asked me when this was going on, what would you be grateful about? I would say nothing. But then when, you, when you're through it, you, you be, like I said, you realize what matters in your life. And it's not most of the stuff you think about most of the time. It's, you know, if, you, if you're healthy and your kids are healthy, 
You should be very grateful. I don't care what your other living condition, but if you get up in the morning, if you're reasonably healthy and your kids are reasonably healthy, you have more than a lot of people and you should be grateful every day for it. And if you think other things are more important than that, you're wrong. And if you, the, the quick way to find out is to have something happen like what happened to us. And you, you know, it didn't. Well, thank God that worked out. Yes. And yeah. yeah. Uh, Again, Dave, Barry, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Lessons from Lucy. I, I'll, I'll, I'll say it again. I, I, I almost never, I think I laughed out loud at this book. And the last book I laughed out loud for was Best State Ever, your book about Florida. Yeah. And the last book before that, now I've forgotten the title, but. Moby Dick. Uh, it was the green and blue one. I, won't, I forget the title. <laughs> I've written a lot of books. But. Yes, 50 books. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. This was great. I really enjoyed it. I'm not kidding. I This was really one of the more well, fun interviews. Well, when you're back in New York ever, I'd love come to. on. Or if we go down to Miami, can you come on the podcast again? Absolutely. I'd love Excellent. to. Excellent. Uh, uh, well, we've now we're out of everything we could possibly talk about. But uh, no, no, we talk about Florida. One the, and and more, there's a thousand more questions I have about humor. And you're the expert in the world. So thank you so much. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.